Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Christ, the Word, make us worthy to prepare ourselves to celebrate the feast of your miraculous birth, when you reconciled the heights and the depths. Fill our hearts with the faith of the Holy Ones who awaited your coming throughout all generations. May your love and peace reign in us that we may glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Ancient of Days, born of the Father before all ages, who at the appointed time took flesh from the Virgin Mary. By his birth he fulfilled the revelation of the Holy Spirit, spoken by the prophets. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Glory to you, O only Son, you are the hope of the nations, awaited for by all generations. You are without beginning or end, yet at the appointed time you chose to be born as a child. You are the great and mighty one, yet you became man without any change to your divinity. You enriched creation, and yet you have become poor, and your mother sang spiritual songs to you as she carried you in her arms. O child, O ancient of days, wrapped in swaddling clothes, the shepherds of Bethlehem and the Magi from the east came to worship you, and the angels gathered to sing to you. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. The church throughout the earth prepares for your birth with joy and gladness. Now, O Lord, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to let the light of your faces shine upon us as it shined in glory upon the shepherds. Fill our hearts with perfect joy and give us an understanding of the mystery of your plan of salvation. With all who have prepared to welcome your feast, we praise, glorify, and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit forever. O 
Lord who is coming among us, accept our incense and give us your grace. Protect your flock that awaits your coming and prepares for your birth. Have mercy on us and upon our departed, that we may be worthy to enter into your kingdom and raise glory and thanks to you forever. Kadishat aloho kadishat hayal to no kadishat lo mahu yuto mishi ho detailed men but David itra Jesus lies in a manger, though he is the Lord of all. Angels join earth in wonder at the Son of God made man. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and her children forever. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart from the gospel of God, which he promised previously through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel about his son, descended from David according to the flesh, but established as Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness, through resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received the grace of apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for all sake of his name among all the Gentiles, among whom you are also, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all the beloved of God in Rome, called to be holy. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I give thanks to my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is herald throughout the world. God is my witness, who I serve with my spirit in proclaiming the gospel of his Son, 
that I remember you constantly, always asking in my prayers that somehow, by God's will, I may at last find my way clear to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may share with you some spiritual gift so that you may be strengthened, that is, so you and I may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith, yours and mine. Praise be to God always. belong to the praise, the glory, honor of the Most Holy Trinity, and burn this incense, Kiri Eleison. Before the proclamation of the Gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, the listeners, of the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, the book of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah became the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez became the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab became the father of Nahashon, Nahashon the father of Salomon, Salomon the father of Boaz, whose, fa whose mother was Rehab. Boaz became the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. David became the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon became the mother of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abiyah. Abiyah, the father of Asaph. Asaph became the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Yoram. Yoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah became the father of Yotam. Yotam, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah became the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah became the father of Yechoniah and his brothers at the time of the Babylonian exile. After the Babylonian exile, Yehoniah became the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud. Abiud became the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok. Zadok became the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliud, Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar became the father of Mattan. 
Matan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of her, was born Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, the total number of generations from Abraham to David is 14 generations. From David to the Babylonian exile, 14 generations. From the Babylonian exile to the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the truth, peace be with you. Jacob became the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Messiah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, when we celebrate Christmas and the Nativity, so often it's portrayed that we're just celebrating the birthday of our Lord. But it's much more than that. This isn't just the celebration of a baby coming into the world. This is the celebration of eternity entering into time. It's a totally different vision. Of course, with the divinity, it's unchanging, stable, eternal. And that stability of light enters into our world of time, which by definition is unstable and in constant flux. So this week in the bulletin, next week in the bulletin, today, on Christmas Day, we're going to consider aspects of time and this eternity that enters into our world. When St. Augustine talks about sanctification, when an individual is made holy, or what grace does or is meant to do to a person, is move them from the instability and the disappointment, if you want, the limitedness of human life towards the stability of the immutable light, which is the divinity. So it moves us in that sense. That grace is meant to move us to a greater sense of serenity, a greater peace, a greater calm, not because things don't go wrong, but because we're changed interiorly. And so this is linked with what we talked about a couple weeks ago about the finality of this world, the enclosed horizons of this world. So it's important to understand the basic understanding over these next the 12 days of Christmas, from Christmas the 25th until the Great Epiphany on the 6th of January, to understand what we're actually celebrating. It isn't just simply a birth. It is a transformation of time which takes place by the entrance of this child into the world. And hence, today's Gospel, which when we first look at it, like, why are we reading this? It's just a bunch of names. But of course, one thing we know is it's inspired scripture, so it's gotta be more than just a list of names. But at the same time, when we're reading it, what is St. Matthew actually doing? Well, at face value, what he's first doing is, to the Jewish converts, to Catholicism, the early Christians who had come from the old law, these people are already believers. They already believe in the virgin birth of our Lord. They know this. But the question comes amongst them that if he's born of a virgin, how is he the son of David? What's his link if he doesn't have a human father to the dynasty of David, of which it is a title of his messianic position as son of David? So that's the first at face value what St. Matthew is doing by giving us a list of who the fathers are and their sons from the time of Abraham down to our Lord, including our Lord, as being the generations that this is the son of David through Joseph, who adopts this child. And for the Jews, this is just as much as a biological. It's the reality that Joseph truly is the father. And Joseph, as a descendant of David, 
truly Jesus, born of Mary, is truly son of David. So that's the reason why the gospel begins this way. It's the reason why when you see representations of the gospels, the four gospels, so that St. John is the eagle and St. Luke is the ox, St. Matthew is the man, the face of the man, because of the genealogy. Now that's the face value, but what is St. Matthew actually doing here? This is quite fascinating in this lineage. He insists upon 14. 14 from the time of Abraham up until the time of David, and from David in the exile, 14 to the exile, and then 14 from exile to our Lord. But of course, there's more than 14 men in those time periods. So St. Matthew has like dropped some of them that we know from the scriptures. But why? Why is he so insistent upon being 14? Now I've mentioned to you before that in many of the ancient languages, Greek for one of them, though not just in the Middle Eastern languages, but Hebrew and Syriac, the alphabet is also used for the number system. So the letter A is one, letter B is two, etc. Simple. But it also means that when you write, you're writing with just what we only call letters. And the name David in Hebrew has the numerical notation, writing Dawid, Dawa, Dawda in Arabic, Dawid. Written in the Hebrew, the letters that are used for the numerical notations add up to 14. And so his insistence is to say, yes, this is son of David. So much so, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. To insist on it, the symbolism of being Dawid, David. But you also have something you see in an inverse of the history. So we talk about time and eternity, time and eternity. He starts out by saying, this is the origin of Jesus Messiah, Yeshua Mishiho. This is the, the origin. And then he says, son of David, son of Abraham. But that's the inverse historically. Abraham lives before David by about a whole millennium thousand years beforehand. And yet he lists him by saying, son of David, son of Abraham. Instead of son of Abraham, son of David, son of David, the Messiah. What St. Matthew is doing is he's knitting together two strains that run through the law of Mount Sinai. So from the time of Moses and the creation of Israel, which is 500 years after Abraham, especially through the prophets and the Psalms, you have two currents that run through the old law. One of them being the very nationalistic vision of Israel chosen, necessarily being educated and guided by God, the Exodus and everything. And that's very much part of the old law. And after the Babylonian captivity, the prophets were even more insistent. Look, you've been doing this disastrously for the last 1,200 years. You have definitely got to form a wall around you, protect yourselves, be truly faithful to the Lord God. And out of that attitude develops the movement of Pharisees. And we have to think of Pharisees as being good people originally. We read the Gospels. When we hear the word Pharisee, it makes you kind of cringe because we're Christians. But the Pharisees are actually highly respected and very good, zealous individuals in general. But also in the prophets and the Psalms, it's clear that someone is to come like Moses, but who is the hope of the nations. This is larger than just Israel. This is a univers universalistic vision for the whole of humanity. And this is the connection with Abraham. Abraham who lives a thousand years before David. Abraham who lives 500 years before this formation of the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. And Abraham, of course, his name is originally Abram. Abu, father. God changes his name to Abraham. 
a father of nations, plural. In Abraham already has this promise of a universalistic aspect of the work of redemption. It becomes narrowed down because God forms a people in Israel. But the promises were made centuries before the formation of Israel at Mount Sinai of a universalist. So the prophets pick up that universalism again. So the entrance of eternity into time shatters the history of the world. Our calendar to this date is redeveloped because of the appearance of this child in Bethlehem. A few years ago, just over a decade, when I was, I had the good fortune of being able to visit Tibet. And the young 24-year-old handler that I had, technically he was the guide, but you can't go to Tibet without having a handler for the communist government. The kid was really charming though, it was great. But as, he's just a Tibetan Buddhist and he didn't know his Buddhism very well either, so in any case. So we talked about Buddhism, we talked about Christianity, and I had all these people who came up to my chest throughout Tibet staring at me nonstop because in China it's not rude to stare. People who almost fell over because they were walking backwards through the marketplaces of Lhasa trying to stare at this, as they told me, this Christian Lama. And they were really impressed because one, you're also like twice as tall as the rest of us. But as I'm talking to him, he says, is Christianity old? And I said, old? I said, um, 2,005 years? And he just looked at me confused. I said, you have no idea that the calendar is calculated according to the entrance of Christ into the world. And he was fascinated by this. We sat on the steps of the Potala Palace of the Dalai Lama talking about Christian calendar of entrance of eternity into time. But that's just a, that's an anecdote. But what happens to Israel, and when you read the gospel, you see our Lord, what's he dealing with? He deals with Pharisees, he deals with scribes, he deals with Sadducees, he deals with Herodians. And we also know about his scenes. There's all these different schools of interpretation of the law of Moses. And when eternity enters time, it shatters open that world. And what you know as Judaism today is just as much a creature of the coming of the Messiah as the Catholic Church that you belong to. They come out of the tradition of the synagogal, rabbinical, pharisaical movement, but they are still, as they exist today, a creature, a development of the coming of the Messiah. But of course, what differentiates the Christian church and modern day Judaism is we define ourselves in accepting him as the Messiah, and they define themselves in rejection of him as the Messiah. But we forget that both of these, as we know them, it's why if you read scholarly works, they'll say, we don't know how the last, we don't know how the last supper exactly went, because we don't know exactly how the Passover services went at the time of our Lord. We have obviously the way modern Jews do the Passover, but we don't know that that is the way that it was done back, especially with all these interpretations. It's one of the reasons why our Lord celebrates the Last Supper, Passover, on what's on the calendar Thursday night. And then St. John in his gospel tells us, no, the temple is offering the Passover on Friday night. Eternity enters into time and it shatters open the human world. And out of that, some of the people of Israel define themselves in opposition to Jesus of Nazareth. He's not the Messiah. And the other ones finally say, thanks be to God, the Messiah that was promised for this time has come. So this shattering, so what St. Matthew is doing is he's bringing together the universalistic aspect of redemption and the nationalistic sentiment of Israel and he's weaving them together in this gospel of these 17 lines. And that to leave you with what I want to point out is the universalistic aspect. You have the name of four women in this list. Now we're talking about the son of David. Matthew could have just listed all of the fathers, but he purposely lists four women. 
And these women are great. You're going to love this. First of all, three of the four women are not even of Israel. They're foreigners. They're Canaanites. They're Moabites. These are foreign women. They're pagan women originally. They're brought into the line of the lineage of the king of David. Because St. Matthew is reminding us that being son of David is a redemption which is meant for all of humanity. And so if you look in the bulletin, you see the names of these women. He just throws them in. This one's born, this one's born, whose mother was Tamar. You have first, you have the twins that are given under the, the, with the woman Tamar. Tamar was a Canaanite. She was married to one of the sons of Judah. So the, the very origin of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel, one of them is Judah, which is why we have our word to this day, Jew. Those are the descendants claiming descent of the tribe of Judah. But in any case, at one point, they weren't a tribe. There was a person called Judah. And Judah had sons, and his first two sons married a woman called Tamar. And the reason why they married them, because the custom was that Moses picks up, that if you married someone and he dies before, you're widowed before you have any children, the custom was you had to marry the brother. And then any children that were born were considered belonging to the older brother, even though he was dead. And so Tamar is a Canaanite woman. She's brought in. She's married to one of Jacob's uh, one of Judah's sons, and the boy dies, the young man dies, and there's no children, so she marries the second one. And he hates his brother, apparently. So he doesn't want to rear up any children. And so the way he does things is he does things on purpose not to have children. It's one of your first examples of contraception. And God is enraged with him, and so he dies. And so she's now widowed twice with no children. And her father-in-law is like, I'm not marrying her to the third one. I got to keep my boys. And so he makes the excuse that my third son's a bit too young. So he sends her back to her parents' house. Well, she's indignant. This is not correct. She's still supposed to marry the third brother. You're depriving me of my children, of my babies, of my family. This is not right. This is not our custom. So Judah just simply ignores her. She's gone, she's good, whatever. And later on, the third brother, of course, is certainly old enough to be married, and he still just ignored Tamar. So Tamar, you'll love the story, because she basically disguises herself and seduces her father-in-law so she can have children. So, nothing like excitement in the Old Testament. But Judah recognized that he had been unjust to her. I mean, you know, we flip out because it's her father-in-law. But the fact is, is that in the story, he recognizes that she is more just than he was. Because he did as father-in-law owe that the third son really did need to bring children into this world and allow her as a woman to have children. And he deprived her of that by not having her marry. No one else is going to marry her because the custom is she has to marry the third son. And so while, and so she has twins. Those are the two sons that are in your list. And of course, Perez becomes the lineage which becomes, you know, descendants towards David. So she's a Canaanite. She's not even part of the people of Israel. She becomes part of that people. So that's the patriarchal period. The middle of Israel's history, the Exodus, when Israel is actually formed on Mount Sinai, there you have Rahab and Ruth. Now, Rahab, to make it even more exciting, she's also not an Israelite. She's a Canaanite also. And she is <clears throat> a lady of the evening. And when Joshua, before they crossed the river Jordan to come in to take the promised land because they've been punished for 40 years because they screwed up their time in the previous generation, whole long story, and now it's time to finally let the grandchildren and the children come in because all the people from that had left Egypt are now dead, which is what God wanted. So he sends in, he sends in two spies into Jericho, the first big city over the Jordan. And they go and they stay in an inn. Well, inns have rooms for rent, and they also rent other things in inns. And so they stay there. You kind of have a combination between, you know, mm, uh, brothel and inn and soldiers coming. So, you know, it all kind of fits together in the classic story of human stories. And Rahab, for some reason, she also takes a liking to them. 
and she protects them. She makes sure that they finish their espionage well and then helps them get out. And she says, I know that God has given our city to you and your people. So when you come back, please remember me. So that's how Rahab not only saves her life when Jericho is taken, she winds up marrying one of these men. And so you have someone outside with a less than you know, stellar professional reputation being grafted into the lineage of David because of course God is here for the salvation of all. And then a Ruth is the very next generation. She's a Moabite. She's also she's not a Canaanite, but she's also not of Israel. And she as a widow is taken in, she's married, and so she also is engrafted in. And then we come to Bethshebe, and that story we've talked about. Bethshebe is the neighbor of David. She's a beautiful lady. She's married to one of the major officers in the, of, of the army of Israel. And David thinks she's just a knockout. He's king. He already has a, couple, a number of wives, but that's all right. He can always add another one on. He can afford it. And while Uriah's off fighting David's wars... David has her invited over <clears throat> for tea. And when Beth should be writes back, she's complicit in this too. This isn't, she's dominated by this man because he's king. She's complicit in this and she contacts him later on and says, um, I'm expecting a baby. And my husband's at war right now. So we're going to have to explain this. So what David does is he goes from bad to worse, which is often what we do in the world of sin, right? We just figure out how we cover our tracks. One lie makes for another lie, and then we just keep spinning ourselves deeper and tying ourselves up. Well, Bathsheba is part of this. Uriah winds up being invited back from the front. David tries to trick him into going and visiting his wife, and then we'll say, see, it's his baby. But Uriah is a very dignified and noble man, and as long as his soldiers are in the trenches, he is not going to go home and enjoy a nice cooked meal and an evening with his wife. So he sleeps with the servants of the palace. He never goes back to his wife's house. So that doesn't work. Sends him back to the battle. In fact, he has it goes two days. The second day, he even has him come to dinner at the palace. Makes him drunk and says, now go home to your wife. And he still goes down and he sleeps with the servants of the palace and never goes back to his wife's house. Didn't work. So then what David does, a lie following a lie, digging ourselves deeper, David then sends an order to have Uriah take this officer, you put him on the front line and you put him where the battle is worse. The worst place possible. And obviously, Uriah is then killed in battle. Which means that Beth should be is a widow and she's free. Now, so this, she's part of this whole scene. And David's conversion, it's a whole long story, but his conversion, realizing what he's done, not because he's a good, not because he's, you know, a prayerful man, but because the prophet comes and tells him exactly what he did. His repentance is Psalm 51. Go home and read it. Look up Psalm 51. That hymn is the result of his conversion. And best to be that baby that was conceived out of adultery and murder died. But her next son that was born was Solomon. David and Solomon, two of the greatest line kings in all of the history of the Old Testament. So you have Solomon. So what Matthew has done, eternity entering into time, Matthew wants us to understand that this is the universal message that has now breaking open out of the national vision of Israel by incorporating these four gallant women to understand that the mission is to all. And so for us, that eternity enters into time, that grace is meant to stabilize our lives and bring us great peace, it is also a consolation to know that in the very preparation by providence for the Messiah's entry into the world, that he's incorporated women into the line. I mean, these men also, many of them were scoundrels too. But these names, these women being incorporated to let us know in our consolation that even in the preparation in time for the coming of the Messiah, that grace and healing are open to all by the entrance of eternity into time, so that time may be healed, our hearts may be healed, 
and our choices may be corrected by the grace of God in redemption. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten God. Tell what my depend a loho, all what a loho than for a time. Why you still got I will talk, hey, you let my talk was good at high at
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now we accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Thecla. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure, and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with a holy kiss worthy of your blessed name that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord.
Lord, as we bow before your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation, and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The pyres on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Father, with your only Son and your only Spirit, one and indivisible in nature, and you sanctify all things by your divine power. For our salvation you sent your Son into the world. He descended, became flesh, suffered, and was crucified for us, who had distorted his image. En sabe lachma bina kodi shanto u barakh u kadesh waksu ya bil talmida karomara sabakhul mehne kul kho hono denita fakhru dil dakhlu faikun wahlof sagiye May Takaseo Meti Hem Hosoyon Hame Wahoyen Al Alam Alameen. Ho Kano Alcoso Damsi Hom and Hamro Hom and Mayon Barahu Ya bil talmi tau kado mara sab shtau mehne kul kho kho no deni tau de mohon dil di anti ki khda to dakhlo fai kun wakhlof sagiye mete shadu meti hab kho soyon khawme wa khayin an alam alamin do this in memory of me, for whenever you eat this body and drink this blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy 
mercy rest upon us. O Christ our God, we remember your plan of salvation, and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels, and all await the reward they deserve, and when you place the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household, and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart, and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. Descent, he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, and cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. O Lord, we now remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory, we pray to you, O Lord. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offerings upon this altar and those who were desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, 
martyrs and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Marin, Saint Tecla, and all the righteous and the just, through their prayers make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. See. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They waned for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, it shall be forever. Amen. oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O oh God the Father, you accept prayers and you answer petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and clear consciences, praying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from the harm of evil, for you have power over all. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you and with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, so that with them, we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, 
one, one Holy Spirit. Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink, O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. For your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your holy cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> so we'd like to take this moment to welcome all of our guests who are here at Mass today. There are booklets in the pews in front of you. In fact, everyone can do this if you wish. 
on the Maronite Church. You're more than welcome to take them with you. It gives you information on the Maronites. And even for our own Maronites, take them with you if you need to explain more to your friends. But in any case, you're more than welcome to take as many as you wish. And I wish you the last ends of these graces as we prepare for the Holy Nativity. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.